I think by the end of this year, uh, Base will be the largest on-chain economy besides Ethereum. Um, I think there's a path for us being the largest on-chain economy, period, um, next year. Uh, and that's what we're focused on. Uh, we're building a global on-chain economy that increases innovation, creativity, and freedom. Uh, we think it's going to be massive. We think that it's going to bring billions of people on-chain, millions of builders. Um, and every day we wake up to figure out how to make that happen faster. Welcome to the Never Die Podcast, your ultimate source of crypto alpha for those who never quit. Today we have on the pod Jesse from Coinbase to talk about everything base, including what is base and what does it uniquely enable? How does base plan to scale to millions and millions of users? Why Jesse believes base will be the biggest chain in all of crypto and the central hub for the entire on-chain economy, and so much more. This was a really great episode. Let's dive in. Well, just to start off, can you really simply explain what is BASE? Yeah. So what's happened over the last uh, few years, I mean, seven years, is that we started to build the next generation of the internet uh, on-chain. And that's maybe a new word that people haven't heard before. But the easiest way to think about it is, you know, we, we brought the world online in the early 2000s. That was obviously hugely transformative. Uh, it created all these tools that we use today, like Google and Facebook and Twitter and, you know, Riverside, where we're recording this podcast. Um, but it had one big problem, which is that uh, when you come online, you start bringing your creativity online. The place that you're generally putting it is in uh, kind of environments that are controlled and owned by large corporations, uh, where you as a creator, you as a, you know, an individual actually don't have that much ownership or control. And so about seven years ago, we created Ethereum. Uh, and, and what Ethereum enables is it really enables the next generation of the internet where you can come on chain. And for the first time, everything you create is yours. Uh, you actually have that ownership, you have that sovereignty. And so people have started building over the last seven years, a ton of on-chain apps. Um, they're doing things with money, like stable coins. Uh, they're doing things with uh, creativity, you know, helping uh, musicians sell their work, you know, tons and tons of ideas. But the, the challenge is that um, they're really expensive on Ethereum. Uh, so maybe you want to send $5 and it costs $5 to send, which is a big problem. And so what BASE is, is BASE is what's called an Ethereum layer two. It lets you run those same on-chain apps but makes them 100 or 1,000, even 10,000 times cheaper. So now to send $5, it costs less than a cent. Um, and that opens up a huge amount of creativity in terms of what people can build. It also opens up a huge amount of access by actually making it so now everyone, every, everyone everywhere in the world can actually use these products. So j just to kind of summarize, so Base is a, a layer two built on top of Ethereum. It is cheaper than Ethereum and allows for more um, different kinds of apps to be built because of that, uh, the transaction costs are so cheap. You'd say that's like basically the distinguishing factor uh, for, for what BASE is, or would you add to that? Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. And then, of course, on top of that kind of open platform, BASE is building a whole ecosystem, a whole culture, um, tons of creativity. And that together is you know, building what we think about as an economy. Uh, and our mission is to build a global on-chain economy that increases innovation, creativity, and freedom. And so you can kind of think about the core technology as this underlying platform uh, where developers are building all these applications. And then you can think about us having kind of an ecosystem of apps that sits on top of that platforms as the second layer that people are using to you know, run businesses and to express their creativity. Uh, and then on top of that, you can think about us having capital markets uh, where people are doing things with money, whether it's trading or borrowing or lending. And those three things, the developer platform, which is the chain, the app ecosystem, which people are using day to day, and then the capital markets that kind of connect the whole economy together, make up an economy. And this is a global economy that anyone can access. And we think it's going to have a huge impact on increasing innovation, creativity and freedom globally. Why base? So, so, so my question would be, why base when we have things like optimism, we have things like Arbitrum, we have other layer two kind of like general purpose networks. Um, why specifically? Does base exist? Yeah. And so first off, a clarification, you know, base is actually a part of optimism. Uh, and this is a transition that has happened over the last kind of year and a half. Originally, optimism was just a layer two. Uh, but then we started working with them. And as a result of our collaboration, I think we saw that there was actually an opportunity to do something bigger than just build one layer two. Uh, and so what we kind of set out on together was on this journey to build what we call a super chain, uh, which is basically a collection of layer twos that are coming together, that are kind of linking arms and saying, hey, we can build more if we work together than if we go alone. 
And so base is built on the OP stack, which is an open source toolkit. We're a core developer of it. Um, it lets anyone run a chain. Uh, base lives alongside what used to be called optimism, which is now called OP mainnet, which was the original chain in the super chain. And together, OP mainnet and base and Zora and mode and Farcaster and Worldcoin and others are building this thing called the super chain, uh, which is going to scale Ethereum, going to bring billions of people on chain. And we really think that base is going to sit at the center of the super chain and thereby at the center of the on-chain economy uh, and actually be the kind of hub that connects all these things together and provides this kind of vibrant, open global economy that everyone else can leverage. So that's just a little bit of context on kind of the relationship between base and optimism. Um, in terms of why build base, uh, I, I think we we thought about it for a long time. You know, I spent uh, about a year and a half kind of trying to figure out how to bring Coinbase on chain. I previously built all of our consumer businesses for five years uh, and wanted to kind of figure out, okay, what's the way we transform this business to, to enter the next generation of the internet and to leverage this technology? And I think when we kind of got into it, what we saw was that um, there wasn't ever going to just be one L2 that scaled Ethereum. Instead, it was going to be this collective effort. And I think what that kind of opened up for us from a mindset and perspective uh, was that uh, we could actually contribute. We could come and say, hey, let's put all of Coinbase's resources behind scaling Ethereum. And the best way to do that was actually to build ourselves. And so that's, I think, a big driver for why we built Base, because we wanted to contribute, because we wanted to have a home on chain that we could build on and that we could open up to everyone else. And then when we did that, we wanted to do it in such a way that it wasn't us on an island but instead that base actually became a bridge. Uh, and that's why we built on the OP stack. That's why we're part of the super chain. That's why we're so committed to open source. Um, that's why we want to be a part of something that's bigger than us, uh, you know, even bigger than Ethereum. So m maybe a good way to describe base and like why base would be that um, you guys are an onboarding kind of mechanism for so many people that come into crypto. They start their journey on Coinbase. Mm -hmm. And so maybe their, their journey they start on chain is on base. It's like the, you know, like right when you get out of the airport, the first place you pull into town it's like boom here's base yep and this is your this is your journey on chain this is where you start um but it's there's a world of possibilities of where you can go from there and and that's that's why base because there isn't really a great onboarding experience for uh going on chain it, it can be really difficult especially for people who don't know how to do it and i feel like especially with coinbase's resources and just how good you guys build things you guys can make that experience really, really just seamless. That's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, the, the mantra that we've said from the beginning is a base is a bridge, not an island, which means that we expect that there's going to be billions of people whose first thing they do on chain is on base. Um, and they're going to continue to be on base. They're going to continue to be a part of this economy. But then we're going to be invested very heavily in making sure that they're not just on base, but that they're everywhere on chain and that they're going to be able to spend their assets and do transactions and express their creativity in whatever they, what way they want across the entire on-chain economy. That kind of connectedness, this idea that we are not alone, but instead we're working together with all these other teams and all these other creatives and all these other developers to bring the world on chain. That's been a core kind of value from the beginning. Yeah, I've gotten that sense from Coinbase as well, especially over this last bear market. You guys have really come out sort sort of as like a crypto native hero uh, in, in that you guys are so aligned with like on-chain values. Um, <clears throat> I was going to say uh, for, for base, it sort of reminds me abstractly of something like Google for the early internet, right? Like if you think about when people got onto the internet, where's the first place they typically would go early internet? That, that'd be Google. Mm -hmm. And then Google was kind of their entryway to the rest of the internet. And so in a lot of ways, um, you know, base maybe is that for on-chain. It's like sort of like this, this launch pad for, for going uh, the rest of on-chain. Yep, exactly right. You mentioned the super chain uh, earlier and, and sort of this vision of like um, building out, you know, the, this optimism super chain with, with the OP stack. How does that actually work in like uh, fundamentally? Like is the vision just kind of like shared standards and like, hey, we, we have these shared uh, values and standards. Is it... Uh, progressing towards like maybe more interoperability of like, hey, we're going to do shared sequencing and all these things to make it so it's like seamless to bridge between these chains. What does that look like long term? Yeah, so it, it's kind of all of the above. I think, you know, at the intent uh, level, um, the, the idea of the super chain is that 
you know, we can do more together than alone. That's like the core belief is like we are bigger together, um, better together. Um, and I think that like a part of that is also just kind of like an ethos and values thing. And I love that optimism is called optimism because I do believe it requires a level of optimism in order to believe that we can do more together. Uh, so I'd say that's where it starts. It's like all of us are committed to this this kind of value set, this vision, this way of being, this optimistic existence. Um, from there, then I think we're building a lot of things together that make it so we can actually achieve that goal. And so a few that are, you know, are very top of mind for me. One is we're building on a shared technology stack. Now, this is called the OP stack. It's open source, public good, MIT licensed. Anyone can use it. Um, Base joined as the second core developer of that alongside OP Labs. And there's tons of other teams across the industry who are now pushing this forward. And so what that means is that whenever Base makes a contribution to scaling Base, everyone else gets to benefit from that. Um, and so that's the first piece. It's like we're going to use this technology stack that's going to uh, kind of jointly let us accelerate the whole industry. The second is um, a kind of economic relationship. Relationship. So base actually contributes back to optimism. Um, whenever there are transaction fees on base, optimism gets a portion of that revenue. Uh, and in exchange, base actually gets to benefit from all of the kind of investment that optimism is doing in their broader ecosystem. So a great example of this is kind of this, this meme that we've been kind of laying, which is that if you build on base, you will be rewarded. Uh, and what that means is that people who come to base and build on base and make an impact on base, they're going to get reinvestment in them. And so over the last six months, um, builders on base have earned something like $50 million in reinvestment. Uh, and the biggest place that that came from uh, is optimism retroactive public goods funding, where people basically came together and said, hey, these were the builders on base that were impactful. We're going to give them a big chunk of change, big chunk of governance votes as well to reward them for those contributions and support them to keep building. So I'd say that economic alignment is the second big one is we contribute to the, the kind of vision and mission and and strategy of optimism and optimism funds uh, builders and, and investment and, and, and uh, kind of uh, the, the work that we're doing on base. And then the, the third piece that kind of you got it is technical interoperability. And this is a, a kind of longer time thing that we're working on. I, speak, I think we're going to make progress on this year and next year. And what that means is basically we're going to take what are currently, you know, separate layer twos that are running on a shared technology stack, the OP stack, and we're going to bring them together. And so they're going to actually share a security council so that they can have more trust and more safety. Uh, they're going to share a bridge so you can actually have interoperability between the assets between them. Uh, they're going to potentially share a sequencing set so that you can actually get better interoperability between those uh, different chains. And what all of that's going to come together and create is uh, connectivity between these chains so that over time for the everyday person, even the everyday developer, these aren't many chains that are isolated, but it's instead one big chain or a super chain. And so I think those are the three kind of easiest prongs to think about this in. One is kind of the values and ethos, which is an optimistic ethos that believes we can be better together. The second is economic alignment, where super chain chains reinvest in the super chain and the super chain reinvests in them. And then the third is technical interoperability, uh, building on this open technology stack and working to make these things more and more cohesive so they can actually work better together from a technical perspective. Kind of to switch subjects. So when, when Ethereum's Dan Kuhn upgrade went live, base went from, I don't know what the fees were before Dan Kuhn, but it, it went to below a cent. Like it really dropped the fees on, yeah. on base. Um, but then we saw uh, just a rush of people, I think, trying to launch meme coins on base, uh, to be honest, just like a meme, meme coin <laughs> mania. And, and that shot up the, the fees um, to last time I checked, it was around 13 cents a swap. I think I saw on Twitter, I don't know if this is legitimate or not. It, at one point, it went as high as $5. I don't know if that's true. Um, but uh, <laughs> true. my question is, um, right now, you guys have around 200,000 active addresses on base. Um, but like Coinbase, is, Coinbase has like 100 million users. And I'd imagine in a full-blown bull market, it will get insane on base. Like there's going to be a lot of people wanting to, to transact on it. What, what are you guys' plans to like scale it up uh, so that it can handle that many users? Yep. Uh, well, first off, we're just getting started. You know, this is still day one. And so we have a lot of hard work ahead of us. And, you know, the mantra that we all like to say internally on our team, and I think it's becoming a little bit of a meme in the base ecosystem, is that the job's not finished. Uh, it's a Kobe quote. Um, but I, I think like that is 
how we feel constantly. It's like, yes, we did great work, but the job's not finished. And the job won't be finished until we literally have the whole world on chain, until billions of people are transacting on base. So a lot of wood to chop uh, to get there. In terms of kind of these fee dynamics, you know, what you're describing is exactly right. We worked for the last two years on EIP 4844, which is going to bring down the layer one costs for running base. Um, the, the base core team was a key contributor there. We, we co-led that alongside the OP Labs team uh, and Ethereum core developers. Um, two years of hard work. About two and a half weeks ago, we shipped that uh, and it brought down those L1 costs in a really, really big way. So we basically reduced the amount that um, you know Ethereum was contributing to the fees on base by like 90%. Uh, and that will stabilize as, as there's more demand. But what that did was it, it brought down fees on base very significantly. But then, and I think this happened a little bit faster than we expected, the demand on base grew very precipitously. <laughs> so we, we 5x the number of transactions on base basically overnight. Um, and what that's contributed to is now there's kind of um, uh, so much demand on base that that's driving the base base fee market, which is base actually has technical constraints um, that are uh, kind of related to the scalability of base itself, not the layer one that um, make it so we can only process so many transactions. And so once we started seeing that, we basically you know, had already started pivoting our whole focus to increase uh, the, the number of transactions that base itself can process. And the, the easiest way to think about this is, is using this uh, term called like a gas target, which is basically the total amount of computation that base can do in a second. And so, uh, you know, our target uh, today is 2.5 million gas a second. So that means we can process 2.5 million gas. Um, that comes out to about like 25, 40 transactions per block, depending on uh, the, the number of uh, the complexity of transactions. Um, and so what we've been seeing is we've actually been seeing more than that. And when you have more than that target, what happens is basically the price of fees goes up and up and up and up until kind of it stabilizes and then it'll go down when you start going below the target. So that's our target today, 2.5 million gas a second. Now, our team has worked you know, a ton over the last two weeks to try and kind of wrap our heads around, okay, the, the scaling challenge has shifted. Before it was L1 costs. Uh, and that's going to continue to be something we need to scale. Now it's actually base L2 execution costs and, and execution speed. How do we increase that target? And we've had a bunch of conversations and we've set a medium term goal of what's called one giga gas a second, which is a thousand million gas a second. So today we're at 2.5 million gas a second. And our medium term goal is 400x that. So a thousand million gas a second or one giga gas a second. It's very memeable. It's very intuitive. It's 400x of where we're, we're doing. And we're still triangulating exactly when we think we're going to be able to do it. But what I'm currently kind of challenging the team to think about is can we do 400x in 400 days? And so that would get us from where we are today to one giga gas a second of throughput by on-chain summer three, which will be in 2025. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of hard work. We still need to figure out whether that's actually possible, but from our initial conversations, it, it looks possible. And we're actually not just waiting, we're actually getting started. So today, uh, March 27th, we're gonna be increasing our target 50%. So we'll go from 2.5 million gas a second to 3.75 million gas a second. Then we'll observe for a few days, and then early next week, we'll increase it to five million gas a second. And so that will have been a first 2x. Uh, from there, we will then have to do another 200x, um, but it's a good start. Uh, and so I think the, the way we're really think about thinking about this is we actually have a very constrained and clear challenge now. It's figure out how we can safely, thoughtfully increase the gas target on base which requires us continuing to increase L1 throughput and data availability. It requires us increasing and improving the execution speed of the actual chain. Uh, and then it requires us figuring out how to solve this kind of gnarly challenge called state growth. Um, but we feel like there's solutions to all of those. And what's really just required now is a bunch of teams, a bunch of really smart folks coming together and solving them. Because, uh, and I saw someone say this uh, online, like this is our Manhattan project. We now have the apps, we have the demand, we have the excitement. <laughs> now we just need to scale the crap out of this thing in a safe, thoughtful, uh, secure way so we can actually bring the entire world on chain. I mean, it's gotta be exciting. You guys saw like, okay, we lowered the fee we massively increase demand. And you know that's just going to keep repeating, right? You yeah. keep lowering the fees, demand keeps increasing. 
Um, and especially with how many users you guys have on Coinbase, it's just going to get out of control. We'll see. Like we're going to get some more data in a, a couple hours when we when we increase throughput fifty percent. Um, but I I think there's a reasonable chance at this point that we never have blocks below target again because we're constantly just going to be increasing through, throughput fifty percent. People will saturate it because the fees are going to go down and then they'll fill them back up. And every single time we increase throughput, there's more and more demand. And so maybe that's not the case and, and maybe something changes. But I think what, what we've seen over the last two, two weeks suggests that there's a ton of demand that's latent right now that we can basically unlock by making it so that more of these transactions can get through. I was going to ask about the OP stack. How I, I don't even know the answer to this, but how strict is it? Like with the OP stack, for example, could a chain join the OP? use the OP stack, but use a different like VM, like the SVM or, you know, et cetera. Or is it like, how, how technically strict is it? Yeah. So the OP stack itself is um, built to be modular. So there's a bunch of different customization stuff you can do. Like you can swap out the data availability layer. You can, um, uh, you know, change the gas parameters. You can add custom pre-compile. So there's a ton that you can do there. The current implementation of the OP stack is is relatively coupled to the EVM. Um, like it, you know, runs on geth, it runs on ref. Um, and so there, I think there, were, there has to be a fairly significant amount of work to swap out the execution kind of engine or the VM. That said, I think we're seeing a ton of experimentation right now on alternate VM uh, chains. Uh, And one of the things that we're really excited about on base is what's called layer threes, uh, which the easiest way to think about is, is kind of, it's just a server that a business runs for their app, but it's an interconnected server that that's connected to the on-chain economy. So now you kind of plug it in to the L2 on base. Now you get your own dedicated block space, just like as if you were running your own AWS, or your own data center, it's all yours. You don't have to worry about congestion, but you can use the user's identity from on-chain. You can bring their assets into that and it all just works. And so what we're seeing a lot of experimentation around right now is people are basically saying, hey, you, you know, base is an incredible on-ramp. You guys are, are bringing all these users in let's try different kinds of l3s on base to make it so that more and more users can have more and more different kinds of experiences and developers can build in different ways and so i expect expect we're going to see a ton of experimentation there we're going to see people build op stack l3s we're going to see people build orbit l3s with arbitrum's technology stack we're going to see people build svm or solana vm l3s the move vm l3s um, other things that we haven't even thought about uh, it's going to be a massive experimentation zone how do you guys plan to onboard uh, current coinbase users to, to base like do you guys have any like cool new yeah. ui ux upgrades you guys are cooking in the kitchen to get the average person from coinbase to you know using base yeah absolutely I, I you know we've been saying for a while that we thought we think there's three big kind of challenges that have been holding back the, the next wave of real utility on chain apps uh in adoption the first is lower fees um you, you can't have people on board and do things that cost five dollars for every transaction it's just not viable and so we've been working to solve that with base for the last two years i think we've made a ton of progress obviously a lot more work we need to do as you I've discussed. The second is uh, we need better identity on chain. Um, and I think we're starting to see this evolve. You know, Coinbase now has brought Coinbase on identity on chain. You can get a Coinbase verification that says, you know, who you are in a privacy preserving way. Um, other application developers can build with that. We've also started to see uh, the rise of social identity starting to emerge on chain. Farcaster, uh, I now use every day, you know, more than Twitter. It has a whole social graph. Uh, and that's enabling developers to build all sorts of you know products that just wouldn't previously be possible because they didn't have a sense of who you actually were on chain. So that's the second big problem. And I think we're making really good progress there. The third is wallets. And this is uh, one that I think all of us have felt some level of frustration around for the last many years. Uh, I like to say that whenever I onboard a new friend to crypto right now, I have to sit them down and give them the talk, which is like, okay, now you've brought $1,000 or whatever it is into your wallet. Like, don't f*** it up. Because if you, you know, leak something or you sign the wrong transaction or something, like, it's all gone. And there's nothing to do about it. And that talk is not viable. Like, we are not going to onboard a billion people if every single time they bring money on chain, someone has to give them a talk. It's like the, the, the easiest way to get everyone to churn. And so we started working on this uh, about six months ago. We've been thinking about it for a while. But we started working on this six months ago to, to try and design um, what we thought could be kind of the next generation of wallets that would just eliminate all of that. Super easy to onboard, uh, super secure and trustworthy, uh, tons of flexibility for users and developers. And what we announced and, and Coinbase launched uh, about a month ago at ETH Denver is what they're calling the smart wallet. 
um, which is a smart contract wallet built on the ERC-4337 standard, which is a standard that everyone's been working on for many years to kind of make it easier to have more flexible wallets. Um, and it does a few things. Um, one is it makes it really, really easy for people to onboard. So before, if you wanted a crypto wallet, you had to go download a separate app. You had to go get a separate ex extension. It was this whole convoluted kind of side quest if you wanted to use something. Not anymore with a smart, smart wallet. You put your fingerprint in, pass key, your wallet's instantly created. Uh, no separate app, no extension, it just works. And that's uh, across any app that supports this. Uh, and all of them will basically support it out of the box. So onboarding is gonna be way easier. The second is security. Um, with the smart wallet, we can program a ton of security into the actual wallet itself. So we can make it so you can have multiple signers. So you can do two-factor authentication for any transaction. Uh, we can have recovery. So you can have Coinbase be a recovery guardian or social recovery. Um, we can have spending limits. So we can say, hey, if you know, you're spending over X, you need a third confirmation. And all of those pieces can basically be combined to give you the same level of trust and surety as your existing bank account today. So that's the, the second thing we're gonna solve. And then the, the third thing uh, is that we open up a whole amount of uh, kind of experimentation zone for developers because this wallet can be programmed. And so that lets us do gasless experiences where developers pay for gas instead of users. Uh, it lets us do batch transactions. So instead of having to do multiple transactions where you're approving every single one of them, you can actually just do one and they'll all be batched into an intuitive single execution. Um, and it lets basically developers have this creative canvas where they can build this next generation of experience. So that's the third one. And then sitting on top of all these and enabled by these, and this is one of the things I'm most excited about. We've combined that onboarding plus the security plus the flexibility to, to roll out something that we call magic spend, which basically means that anyone with a smart wallet, if they have a Coinbase account or they have any off-chain payment method, they're gonna be able to link that and instantly use it on-chain for any transaction. So if you have ETH or Bitcoin or USDC sitting in your Coinbase account and you go to OpenSea and you want an NFT, you no longer have to send money from your Coinbase balance and get in the right network. You just transact, you select your Coinbase balance, it all gets combined into one transaction and executed. And that ability to connect up that, you know, $180 billion worth of assets that are living on Coinbase today um, with a dead simple wallet experience that anyone can use to access any on-chain app, I think is going to open the floodgates in terms of uh, the, the quality of experiences that developers can build and the ease of use that, that users actually have for accessing these apps. Yeah, I totally agree. Because, I mean, that's a great way to get people on-chain because they don't have to think about getting on chain. They just say, Hey, Hey, you don't think about it. Yeah. I want to get this token or I want to get this NFT. Right. It's just like, I want to use this cool app and now it just works. <laughs> Cause at first you're just, you're describing magic spin. I was like, why would you want that? But then when you said it, when you said, you know, getting um, all the, all these funds and Coinbase on chain, I was like, ah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, w did you say when that goes live, the, the smart wallet? Yeah, so they, they la launched the test net in like end of February. So any developer can go and integrate this. If you go to smart-wallet.xyz, uh, it's from Coinbase. Uh, all you have to do is kind of bump your rainbow kit version or whatever wallet provider and it'll be there out of the box, no separate integration needed. And then in terms of mainnet, uh, don't have an exact timeline, but it's measured in weeks right now. Weeks. Uh, so we're, we're not far. Um, it's coming soon. Coming so you're soon. You're saying in in a couple weeks, potentially a month, I'll be able to go use this smart wallet and start transacting with it on chain. Yes, that's amazing. Yes, yes. <laughs> I would. I would. I'm not going to commit to a couple weeks, but measured in weeks. Um, and I, I, I'm going to be here before on chain summer because uh, we have a lot planned for on chain summer, and I want to make sure that you know we can make it so everyday people, if they're you know on the street and they learn about on chain summer. They don't have to go on the side quest. They can just do the thing they want to do right there. Switching subjects again, um, w looking at base, one thing I think about often is like sort of what level of decentralization you guys are aiming for ultimately with base and what level of decentralization is, is ultimately needed for base. Yeah. So we've been pretty consistent from the beginning that we are working to make base have the same decentralization characteristics as Ethereum. Uh, we want base to be an open, global, on-chain economy that's accessible to everyone, that increases innovation, creativity, and freedom. And we believe that in order to have that open, global nature, you actually need to be extremely decentralized because that's the thing that actually enables everyone to access it. 
And so that's obviously a journey to get there, right? Ethereum has been working on their decentralization for seven years. Ethereum is uh, base is seven months old. So we're not going to get there immediately. But the way we've set up the base network today is such that from the beginning, there's never been a single entity that has full control of it. So, you know, we set up the upgrade keys. We, we, we set up all of that so that uh, checks and balances existed. So the OP Foundation basically checks and balances um, the base core team. Uh, and then what we're working on right now is progressing progressing from what's called a stage zero rollup, which is kind of the first level of decentralization, to what's called a stage two rollup, which is basically inheriting the level of decentralization of Ethereum. And the next big milestone is stage one. Uh, and we have a pretty clear line of sight to do that. Um, it's definitely going to happen this year. Um, I think it's going to happen sooner uh, than, than many people might expect. And the two key things there are uh, bringing fault proofs live. Um, they're already running on testnet. We just did that uh, a couple weeks ago, the kind of like final version. It's going through audit right now. Um, and then uh, moving base to a full security council um, that we've built we spent the last nine months building, uh, we just need to transition to. So I, I think that's going to be the next big milestone. And then we'll be working you know, at, later this year, or next year to get to stage two, uh, which means having multiple provers, which is very possible, um, uh, and kind of continuing to expand and evolve the Security Council. So Again, our our goal, intent, plan is to have uh, base inherit the same security and decentralization characteristics as Ethereum because we believe that's critical for building an open global on-chain economy. Uh, we have a lot of work to do to get there, kind of like we have a lot of work to do with scaling. But uh, we're going to wake up every single day and you know put our put our nose to the grindstone to get there. So how does that ultimately work out for Coinbase? So like, say it's fully decentralized. Um, is are you guys still getting like fees from it? Like, how does that work long term for Coinbase? Yeah, you know. There's, there's still a lot to be figured out in terms of the governance and the, the value flows. Um, but what I'd say is that Coinbase's perspective from the beginning, you can go back to kind of reading Brian's secret master plan from 2016, is that we want to end up in a world where you have millions of apps on chain that billions of people are using. And we see Base as a platform for enabling those millions of apps that billions of people can onboard to use. And so regardless of how Base decentralizes, regardless of what happens with the fee revenue, uh, regardless of what happens with the, the decentralization, I think I think Coinbase is going to be in an incredible position because of its relationship with Base um, and because of the fact that it's kind of incubating and supporting Base to decentralize to build those applications um, and to be kind of the front door, the gateway to on-chain, where every consumer in the world, when they think about what's happening on-chain, they think Coinbase. And when they go to do their first app, they use Coinbase. Um, that opportunity of owning the end customer relationship uh, and letting everyone access these apps, that is the key thing that Coinbase is getting. And what base is enabling is we're bringing up that timeline. What was previously going to be years or decades because of our work is now going to happen in months and years. And that's a huge accelerant for Coinbase's business. And we're already starting to see this make a massive impact. Um, Coinbase every day is doing more and more things on chain. Uh, they actually just announced yesterday that they're moving more of their USDC balances to base because it's giving them faster settlement, uh, uh, making it cheaper for them, for them to, to kind of manage all those funds. And I, I really think that that's just the beginning. Um, they're going to be moving pretty much every part of the business on chain over the next few years. That's amazing. And uh, I, that makes a lot of sense that you'd want to start off controlling maybe the ecosystem and then slowly kind of integrating yourself on a deeper level where maybe you don't control the base level of the chain. Um, but you've built a lot of applications and, and value capture for Coinbase on there that makes it easier for people to get on chain, um, but also, you know, uh, works with the, the Coinbase business model. Um, Kind of going along with that. Okay, so, so let's imagine five years down the line, whatever, um, base is fully decentralized. In your opinion, do you think like a lot of people speculate about a base token existing? And I've always thought like, oh, well, why would base need a token? Like it doesn't make any sense. But fully decentralized, I mean, people like tokens. <laughs> and um, maybe at that point, it does make sense. Do you guys talk about that? Or, or what are you guys' thoughts about that? Yeah, we've talked about this. We, we've been pretty clear from the beginning. There's no plans for a network token for base. Um, uh, you know, decentralization is a, a journey. And we're, uh, you know, just starting down that path. And there's a lot of work to do. Um, one of the things I'm most excited about is I think we're already organically starting to see um, kind of these like cultural movement and cultural organizations cross up in base, things like base management and yellow collective. Um, uh, and I think my sense is that because we kind of haven't had this monolithic kind of token governance infrastructure, what we're actually seeing is kind of this bottoms up 
governance ecosystem evolve. And I'm really excited about figuring out how to amplify and kind of uh, give those folks more voice, more control, more agency to kind of shape the direction of base. Because again, I, we think about base as an economy. And the way you build an economy, by a vibrant economy, is by lifting up the people who are creating, uh, contributing the creativity, contributing the economic output to actually make that economy successful. And so I think our, our short to medium term focus is definitely on identifying those leaders and the organizations that they're starting, the movements that they're backing, and then giving them more resources, more influence, more agency, more governance rights to actually help shape the future of base. I guess maybe to sort of rephrase my question would be less about like, does Coinbase think it needs a, a token and more about like, do you think, I guess, base could exist without a token? Like, um, what are your thoughts on, you know, maybe, you know, each just the gas token and you guys have built like a, a governance model using maybe, um, you know, the, the folks that optimism like is there a reality where it doesn't need a token or do you think ultimately all chains are going to end up at like hey we need a token for x y and z yeah i mean i'm not going to be like definitive on all chains or no chains or base yes or no um but i do think that what we're seeing today is that base is being hugely successful without a token uh and i think the thing that um that has really done for us is it's clarified to our team what matters like I think one of the challenges we've seen with with kind of tokens over the last five years is that when you inject kind of this financial incentive, and particularly when it's really, really inflated from a value perspective, you can see folks kind of lose sight of, uh, and sometimes just lose signal on like, am I building a good product? Do people actually care about my product or do they just want the money? Am I attracting missionaries, not mercenaries? And I think what not having a token has done for us and our team is it's basically filtered out all that noise. So now what we are ruthlessly evaluating ourselves on, and I think what everyone's evaluating us on, is can we build a platform and product that everyone wants to use? Can we build a culture that everyone wants to be a part of? Uh, can we acquire developers with card hold? cold, hard cash uh, and make it so that that's ROI positive. Um, like those are all really, really hard problems that I think most businesses just have to confront because that is the work of finding product market fit or ecosystem market fit. Um, and I, I think that a lot of people in crypto have sometimes skipped that because they've just gone straight <laughs> to the token. They've gone straight to the financial incentive. And so I think what we're seeing actually on base is that because we haven't skipped that, we've actually been more successful because it's caused us to be super rigorous about how we support developers, be super rigorous about what is the culture we're building, super rigorous about is the product we're making actually great. And so uh, regardless of what happens in the future, that for me is the key. It's how do we stay focused on those key insights of are we actually building something people love? And I think that not having a token has helped us do that. I love everything you just said. Uh, what are some of your favorite, like current favorite apps or projects that are building on base oh man it's people ask me this all the time i'm like yeah you know you want me to name one <laughs> <laughs> there's there's so many really cool things happening on base uh, a few that are kind of top of mind for me um blackbird uh, created by the founder of res uh, resi and eater um you know two of the probably most successful uh, startup food startups in the u.s over the last decade two decades um they're doing kind of like local loyalty in, in restaurants and payments um i think in like more than 100 restaurants in new york right now expanding national uh, hugely, hugely successful. Everyone loves it whenever they use it on base. Um, Farcaster, uh, you know, we work really closely with them. All of the, the kind of innovation they've been doing around frames, which are basically like little mini apps that any developer can build in an on-chain social feed. Um, so you can be scrolling in the feed, you can buy something. You can be scrolling, you can mint something. You can scrolling, you can tip. Um, gives you all of the kind of power of a uh, social feed. Uh, but with all the flexibility of developer platform on an open permissionless platform that anyone can um, build on and have trust, it's not going to go be going away. Um, a lot of that's built on base. So I think today, when we look at like forecaster transaction market share for base, base has something like 70, 75% transaction market share. So tons of innovation happening there. Um, a lot of other ones, base paint. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that, but it's basically like a global art project where every day artists from all around the world come together to do a pixel drawing based on a theme. They're constantly kind of like drawing over each other and coordinating and trying to shape this thing. Um, and then after 24 hours of drawing, it gets minted for 24 hours. Uh, and people just 
pay two to three bucks to, to get that piece of art. Uh, and it has earned millions of dollars in, in uh, kind of revenue and payments for creatives, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of mints, um, hugely, hugely successful and such a cool example of something that's really only possible to be built on chain because it's accessible to everyone, because you can do these really cool kind of financial, economic uh, kind of building blocks that come together to enable you to build this experience. Um, so those are those are three ones. Obviously, there's tons of kind of uh, DeFi and trading and borrowing and lending. Um, Aerodrome, for instance, is like a base nader project that has really blown up in the last little while. Um, uh, and, you know, you mentioned at the beginning of the call, a lot of meme energy. Um, <laughs> I don't call those things meme coins. I call them just memes. Um, and I think the, the memes that are successful on base are base memes. Uh, and what that means is they're not just like flash in the pan um, jokes or like people making fun of people or people doing things that like just get attention and are like kind of candy that you eat and then you feel bad. These are people who are saying, hey, there's an economy being built here. And as part of any economy, you need cultural movements, whether that's religion or that's sports teams or it's memes. You need those movements. And they're saying, hey, we want to buckle down and build these things for the long run. Uh, and I think what you're seeing come out of this is incredible creativity. Uh, if you look at the memes on base, they are all producing incredible content. They're putting them on chain. They're letting people mint it. They're, they're, they're working together. They're not tearing each other down. They're being collaborative. And all of those things, that is indicative of the based mentality. It's the based value set. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that, both from the meme economy that's starting to burge, and, but also from, from all of the other incredible components of the base economy. I, uh, I hadn't heard of the, the Blackbird one you mentioned, but I'd heard of the other ones. I love Farcaster. Um, I haven't used base paint, but I've heard about it because I've never heard of anything like that except for on base. But it made me think, I almost wonder if you guys are going to have this more of a startup culture because you guys are, you know, Coinbase is a publicly traded company. You guys have like that Silicon Valley energy, right? And so I, I'd imagine you'd attract other people that are like that, like genuine builders trying to build crazy cool things and maybe some opportunities. Yeah, oh, well, go ahead. I, yeah, well, we, you know, I don't love this analogy because it's a little US centric, but you can kind of think about the super chain as, um, like a federal government, right? Uh, and all the sub chains in it are states um, in that federal government. And the best analogy I've had for base, uh, like you think about OP Mainnet, the original optimism, it's kind of like Washington DC, right? It's like the seat of government. Uh, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna have its own things, but it's like mostly gonna be governance. I think about base is California. Like this is the, the center of innovation. This is the, the largest economy in the, in the nation, the union. Um, this is where you see this kind of next generation of applications. It, it, ha it has its own form of creativity that's like wild and tech related, but also incredibly kind of diverse and vibrant. And so I, I think you're exactly right. Like the people that are attracted to come build on base are these builders um, who they, they work hard. Um, they put the team over the individual. They're like not afraid to be creative and to push boundaries to achieve that creativity. Um, they stay optimistic. They, they, they work together. Um, and I think that ethos, I mean, that, that's, that's what it's all about. And that's why I think we're going to be able to have this economy that we build over the next decade that brings billions of people on chain. I couldn't agree more. The, the quality of people you guys end up attracting to build on the chain is going to ultimately equal the success of base. Um, last I checked, you guys were fifth in volume, 10th in TVL, and obviously you guys are <laughs> one of the fastest growing chains in the space. Uh, where do you guys hope to be in say two years? Yeah, well, I, I, I you might need to update those numbers because I think they've grown a little <laughs> bit since, uh, yesterday even, I, I think yesterday and today bases like the top volume chain in, in the world wow. right now, or at least it's close. Um, like I think we had over a billion dollars in volume yesterday. Um, TVL is growing very quickly. Uh, you know, I think we're about across three billion. Um, so I think those numbers, you know, uh, we, can, we can check on that later. But I, um, <laughs> I actually did a tweet about this yesterday because I'm trying to get a little bit of sentiment check too from the ecosystem. And I basically was like, okay, everyone, like, when do you think um, base will be the largest on-chain economy besides Ethereum as measured by daily DEX volume and value locked in protocols? Um, and I, I put three months, 12 months, 24 months and never like 60, 70 percent of people said three months. Um, uh, the like 20 percent said 12 months, 10 percent said 24 months and like three percent said never. 
So, I mean, I obviously have like a biased following on Twitter, yeah. so I, I'm not going to take it at full face value, but I think that's that's how I feel. Like, I think we're accelerating uh, pretty quickly. I don't know if it'll be three months, but uh, I think by the end of this year, uh, Base will be the largest on-chain economy besides Ethereum. Um, I think there's a path for us being the largest on-chain economy, period, um, next year. Uh, and that's what we're focused on. Uh, we're building a global on-chain economy that increases innovation, creativity, and freedom. Uh, we think it's going to be massive. We think that it's going to bring billions of people on-chain, millions of builders. Um, and every day we wake up to figure out how to make that happen faster. Well, I think we're really lucky in the crypto space to have Coinbase doing this because there's a lot of other people that could be doing it. And uh, there's others that have tried um, th that I don't think are as aligned and as invested in the crypto ethos as Coinbase. I, can you imagine if FTX wouldn't have collapsed and they're like, hey, we're building our, <laughs> our own L2 or, you know, like it, it, there's so many ways it could have gone horribly. And uh, I think this is like the best outcome possible, right? You know, you have Coinbase, yeah. one of the best companies, the good guys in the space, building base and, uh, and helping more people get on chain. It's amazing. Yeah, well, shout out to Brian, uh, fearless leader from the beginning. You know, he he's such a staunch advocate for crypto, for decentralization, uh, for freedom. Um, I think we've seen that, you know, he's been willing again and again to stand up for that, whether it's in the courts or, uh, you know, in Congress um, or just with the, the, the strategy that Coinbase executes on. And so I feel really lucky to have gotten the opportunity to build base inside of Coinbase and to have had his backing and in, in taking on this challenge. And uh, I do think that, uh, you know, uh, we're lucky. We're lucky to have someone like Coinbase who is kind of like lawfully good, um, is trying to do the right thing always, is uh, pushing hard, but also is um, not afraid to stand up for what's right, even when other people are going to say, hey, you know, we're going to sue you or whatever it is. And so I, I feel super grateful to be a part of it. And I feel really excited about what's to come. Me too. I, I feel like I saw on Twitter some sort of bet or something like there's something where you have to shave your head. Is that a real thing? <laughs> or is it, <laughs> what it's is like that? my biggest regret that I made. <laughs> it's, it's all happening fast. Tonight. What is that? Uh, uh, what is that? Um, that is, yeah, there, there's this, there's a meme on, um, there's a meme on base called thank you base God, which I think about as a religion, basically, um, <laughs> it's a, a weird religion, but it's a religion. Um, and they have this concept called the bald list, which is basically like you can set a goal. And then when you achieve that goal, you have to shave your head to go bald because that's like, you know, part of the religious tenets, right? It's like bald and, you know, bald and moisturized, whatever it is. Um, and I was just like, you know, I, I, I hang out on all the memes. Like I'm just try constantly trying to get a pulse of what's going on. And, um, you know, I saw people talking about this and I like offhand said when base TVL gets to $10 billion, like that's my bald list. This was whatever, like three months ago, um, two months ago. And of course, like no one will ever let me live that down. And it's it's happening a lot faster. When I said that, A, I was like, it was offhand comment. You know, I wasn't thinking all the way through. And B, I was like, no, it'll be in a couple of years. I'll deal with it then. But now it's like we're costing $3 billion. It's like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, I, I had long hair up until the beginning of this year. Now I have short hair. I felt like that was kind of a step. Um, so I'm hoping that when I have to go bald, it... Um it doesn't feel too, too intense for people. They've gotten a little bit of priming. And the great thing about hair is it grows back. Um, so, I mean, hopefully. Uh, hopefully it's June or July and you're, you're just loving it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. On, on chain summer, right? Just stay on chain summer. That's perfect. <laughs> um, last question. What are you most excited about when it comes to base or maybe even just crypto broadly like could be the smart wallet, whatever, m moving forward? <sighs> I'd say the thing I'm most excited about is it feels like for 10 years, we've been building all of the infrastructure. And now just in the last six months, it started to click into place. And I, I feel like we are a transformer right now where it's like literally we have all of these different limbs and they're starting to just like... And when they click into place, when we have the smart wallet uh, with the identity that's social on top of the chain that's cheap with all the on ramps and the user experiences and the apps, like this is going to take the world by storm. And I, I would have said a few years ago, like, yeah, that's going to happen someday. But now I'm like, no, we're like knocking on the door. We are knocking on the door. The infrastructure is all here. It's starting to click together. The apps are being built. Uh, and I think the next few years are going to be unlike anything anyone's ever seen as we literally bring the entire world on chain. And so that 
I mean, that gets me so fired up. I can't go, I can't sleep. I can't fall asleep. Every day I wake up and I just think about this. I'm like, what do I need to do today to bring the world on chain? Uh, so yeah, I, I'm just excited about being here and being a part of it. Well, Jesse, it was great to have you. Um, it's great to have a fellow Jesse on the pod, yeah. <laughs> the, the pod for the first time. So it's amazing. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. This was great. Yeah. As always, none of this was investment advice. You should always do your own research. Crypto is obviously really risky. You can act like an adult, own your decisions, and uh, 